Okay, so um, in a slightly joined up way of thinking, uh, we've talked about the design of the network and we're now going to talk about when we've actually got a network installed, um, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to prove that it works once it's been installed? Um, maybe you've installed it, maybe somebody else has installed it for you. Um, we need to have a little bit of a think about it. So, um, let's give up. Okay, um, again, slightly joined up. Um, these two documents are great um, when you're designing and installing the network um, or confirming that there are uh, that it's been installed. There's even in the back of them there is a like a tick sheet of have you done X, Y, or Z, um, and we'll come through some of those a little bit more um, in a second. But the cabling in our system, if we start with the cabling in the system, is what we're going to look at first. And there's a couple of different levels of testing that we can do. So we can do a verification test. We've plugged it all together. Does it work? Very simple, but there's no, there's no science to it. There's no evidence there. We can do a qualification test. We can plug it all together, check that they, we've got wires from one end to another, and go, yep, that does it. Or, and this certainly the certification one is required in a lot of places, airports, nuclear industry, anywhere that's really, really important that it doesn't go wrong. Um, or, um, and actually one of the companies that was mentioned earlier, and you may all have had an email from this morning, um, they like all of their Ethernet stuff to be certified, but they weren't too worried about the Profinet initially. They just went with, well, it'll be all right. Um, so, depends on the company but there are different levels, and we'll, we'll investigate those a little bit further now. Right, so the verification test, a wire test. You can do this, in theory, with a tape measure and a £10 tester off Amazon. It's possible. And a notebook. However, uh, if I saw you going around with that sort of level of kit, I'm not sure I'd hire you for a second time. So, there are better testers, shall we say, um, that will give you this sort of information. So, are all our cores connected? What length are they? What's the maximum length for an Ethernet cable? 90. 90. 100. No, 90 to 100 meters. 100 meters is the official max. So, is it? does it go? Inside a cable, there are pairs of cables, and some of those can be different lengths, given how the cables wound together. Depending on whether you buy a cheap cable or a more expensive cable, those pairs might be closer together than others. Okay, um, There's all sorts of things in there, and we'll, we'll go into some of those in a little bit more detail in a minute. But what we're really looking for is, is it less than 100 meters? Are all the cores connected? How many cores are in a Profinet cable? This image is slightly misleading. <laughs> there are only f only four wires in a Profinet cable, but uh, an Ethernet cable has eight and a shield. Is the shield connected? Is there is it even shielded cable? Now, depending on your situation, you can have a shield around the outside. You can have shield around individual pairs of wires. There's all sorts of flavors of cabling. Um, and that should have been designed in the design phase. Um, bit error rate test, so it squirts a load of data down the cable and sees how much of it gets to the other end. Really simple test. Um, yeah. Okay, now we'll come on to something slightly more interesting, if you like, um, a qualification test. So we're looking at all the things that we looked at in the verification test, and we're adding some extra bits on. OK? So we're trying to determine whether this cable is actually going to reliably send data down it. So in the verification test, we literally squirted some data down it and see if it was received at the other end. If it is, it passes. There's nothing more to it. When we come on to a qualification test, we're looking a little bit more detail at this. 
So, you know, is there some electrical noise being in the system somewhere, and is that going to impact your, da your data receiving at the other end eventually? Are pairs of wires talking, um, or sorry, are the pairs in the wire, are they causing interference with other pairs in the wire? Um, that can be either at source end or, or the far end. All sorts of stuff like that. Um, so we can do another a bit error rate test. We can send packets down, see how many we get back. Rather than just sending and getting a yes or no, we can actually measure the number of packets that receive at the other end. Um, if we want our network to work nicely, uh, on the uh, couple of previous slides, um, if we've got data going down these wires, 95 meters, 100 meters, 96, 97, they're all more or less the same. It's all going to work more or less. However, if you've got one that's particularly long or particularly short, then you can end up with issues in there. OK, so what does this produce? So hopefully, we're going to get a, a cable qualification report out of this. And it can look something like this. This is from a job I did up in Scotland earlier in this year. Um, hopefully. All of the examples I've got today are genuinely examples from places I've been, um, and hopefully I've anonymized them all suitably. Um, this was a job up in Scotland earlier in the year. Um, so lots of, lots of cabling in here. This particular network was um, Ethernet between the IT system and the um, baggage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Gave the game away there. Uh, between the industrial network and the non-industrial network, shall we say. So, um, big job, lots of cables. Um, some of them, when I arrived to do the verification testing, worked, and some of them didn't, and spent a lot of nights waiting for people to change cables, remake ends, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, there we go. So. The tool can produce details like this. So we've got individual reports for each of the cables on the left. Uh, so this is one cable, this is one cable, this is one cable, and then you've got a summary of them down here. Um, OK. If we go on to a certification, we're going another level higher. So we're looking at a lot more data. It takes a little bit more. Um, interpreting, and I'm not going to go into it because it's all far too small for any of you to see any, anything other than a few squiggly lines, I suspect. However, basics are we've got one, one page per cable now rather than 10 on a page or whatever. Um, the whole lot is a lot more, more thorough. Um, I don't actually sell the testers for these, but the tester for this sort of level of test 1,500 pounds, 13, 1,500 pounds, something like that. The tester for doing this um, is about 9,500 pounds. Um, and if you want to do something like higher uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet, et cetera, you can be talking 15, 20, 25,000 pounds for a tester. Um, so I rent them when I need them. <laughs> They're just too expensive for and not the level of stuff that I do day to day. OK. So we get a little bit more detail than just a pass-fail. We get all this. And actually, some of this information, and again, you can't see it very well, but some of this information is really useful when you get a cable that is not passing the test. You can actually go, well, OK, we've got a massive spike here. The reason is that we're failing is about 40 meters down this cable. And you can actually determine this from the, from the tools. OK, so there's all sorts of interference and stuff that can go on. Um, one of the things that was in some of these slides was uh, next and fext. Um, and that is basically where the pairs inside are getting interference from other pairs inside the cable. And they're talking between them. I'll leave that for one second. Okay. 
Andy talked a little bit about designing your network, and there's more to doing an acceptance test on a network than just checking the cable. There's a little bit more to it when you do a full um, acceptance test. So, some of the parts that are in the acceptance test um, document that we showed on the first slide. Um, does the system inventory match what was designed? If you've said you're going to have 21 devices and they are going to be X, Y, and Z, has the installer actually installed those 21 devices or have there been a, some sort of supply chain issue and they've done 20 of the devices you're expecting and one something else? Is that something else going to actually do the job you wanted? Has the network installer followed the network installation design that was produced and connected it together in the way that you expected. If they've managed to save half a day and a whole couple of reels of cable by shortcutting and not going, as Andy showed, going the way that was designed to level out the load and make sure that the load in any one of those segments is acceptable, you're going to run into problems. It's when you run the initial test, it's going to show that you've got 21 devices and everyone's going to assume that it's done okay until you run the test and it shows you that perhaps it isn't quite as you'd expected. Again, we can run the packet loss. So there's all sorts of ways that we can do that. Um, a lot of the test tools will, uh, will do a sample for you. Um, and we can check the network loading. So the, the, there's a lot of things in there. So um, given that we've already done a little bit of designing, I think we'll skip some of this. But um, having a good network design really helps. Um, and having it designed, uh, hopefully, again, this is uh, hopefully completely obscured for what it is. Um, so on here, we have a switch. We have individual cables, but it li lists port one on here going to port seven on here. How do we verify that that's the case without going around every cabinet, every box, every locked everywhere and checking it? We need to use a tool. Are the cables marked? There's a couple of places I've been to recently where the cable markers were there. You can see the evidence that once upon a time there was a cable marker there, but actually they've fallen off or they've just faded to the point where you can't read them, um, which makes diagnostics really difficult. Um, for Profinet systems, is the device name correct? Um, if you get an uppercase and a lowercase mixed up, if you add a bit of punctuation where there isn't any, you suddenly run into problems. Um, and one of the other useful things to have in this system is a general location. So when you are looking for something, um, whereabouts is it? If you're walking around a factory, is it at that end or is it at that end? OK, next bit on here is having a decent diagram. Having that is 10 times more useful in some ways than that. They're both useful for various things, but this gives us a much clearer idea of how the whole system's hanging together and where we're expecting things. As far as the inventory goes, um, there are various ways to collect this. Um, but have we got the right firmware for, the, for what we're expecting? Is it actually the right device? Has it got the right sub-modules installed, et cetera, et cetera? Many Profinet devices are hot swappable. So if one breaks, you unplug it, plug a new one in, and off you go again. Uh, our topology, we can run topology tests, um, and it so this is a device, the, what's the Siemens software? Pronetta? Yeah. Pronetta does a, a very similar thing. So it shows you 
devices, where they're connected, which port number they're on. Uh, it'll tell you yeah, everything you need to know about the actual physical layout of your network, all from the push of a button. We can check the number of packets we've lost. Um, I'd hope that in a brand new system we wouldn't be losing any. Um, if, you, if you're doing this check on day one and you're losing uh, packets, then we're really in a, in a sticky situation to start with. Andy talked quite a bit about network loading, so I won't, uh, won't labour the point. Uh, but again, you, know, you can design all of this. And one of the problems I've had um, was in March time this year, um, someone had changed uh, one of the devices and come up with a higher resolution camera, uh, installed the higher resolution camera, causing slightly more uh, data on the network, just push the levels up. It wasn't a problem all the time. It probably once in 48 hours it was a problem. And it just tipped it over the edge and started losing packets on other things. So we can use tools to uh, have a look at the number of packets on the network. We can look at the loading of each device. And then we can check how much spare capacity we've got. At the end of all of this, hopefully, we can produce a report. Um, it takes a little bit of work to, and hopefully, this is going to open. Oh, it even worked. So this again, this again, sorry, is a genuine report. I've just anonymized it um, for the. Oh, come on. OK, so looking at this report, we've got a, a fictional company that uh, is around. And we've got, we've got a number of parts here. So we've got a report. Um, and what I've found is that the network does work. However, there are some issues. So we've got some rework recommended. We've got some areas where, and we'll skim through the report slowly, but um, Essentially, the network was still being configured while I was testing the physical side of it. So there were a few issues um, that we'll have a look in as we go down here. OK, so one of the things that happened is that um, there were some ASI gateways on this network. And for reasons I'm still not quite sure of, the ASI gateways themselves were limited to 10 meg connections. So the uh, report that I did brought up the fact that some of the links were only capable of a 10 meg connection. Not quite sure why, and the engineers are still looking into that. Um, there were also, and this was a little bit more worrying, um, there were four devices on the network physically connected to it that were not on the schematics that I was given. Um, so that took a little bit of talking between uh, between us and, and the host company to see why on earth there were devices on the network that uh, shouldn't be there. Um, we have a look at the Ethernet end of, end of things. So we can put in a mask and say everything should be in this range. All the devices were in that range. There's a warning here that some of the subnet masks were not the same as what we were expecting. And the default gateway was not the same as we were expecting. Um, one of the interesting things for this one, um, the maximum line depth was quite high, but not outside of their expected uh, thing. They defined that the maximum line depth for their system was 22 devices. Um, it was quite high, but it was, it was fine. Um, the other thing, uh, and we'll scroll in here, is um, that the naming convention on there, uh, w when we go through other pages, you'll see all the devices have a, a similar name apart from one. There's one device on there that starts PN-0033. Quite why? Again, doesn't match their drawings. Just another thing to bring up. OK, lots, of, lots and lots of stuff here. 
Um, yeah, for some reason, we have one device that doesn't follow the naming convention. No idea why, but that wasn't my problem. That was just to feed back to them and ask them to clarify why. Uh, again, we should get one in here that's in red uh, because, yeah, so these um, ASI gateways, for some reason, they were limited to a 10 meg connection. Absolutely no idea why, but that was something for them to, to resolve. Okay, and we've got the cable results. So, we produced a report I uh, can't see it. There we are. A lot of the things that are in the reports are very simple. They can be measured very simply on their own. However, to produce an actual report from them takes a lot of work. Um, so it's a lot easier if you can use a tool to do it that c brings the whole lot in together rather than doing it individually. Um, ensure that we've actually got qualified and trained people to do this. Um, Peter does an excellent job of training uh, in the UK. Um, if you get the right people to install it, the chances of it working are a great deal higher uh, than if you use electricians nicest possible way okay a couple of other things to have a look at when we profinet typical failures there aren't many it's pretty good most of the problems tend to be from poor planning in the grand scheme of things um, but some of the other things that we see is the use of the wrong GSDML file. It happens the same in uh, Profibus. People use the wrong, wrong GSD file. Configuration errors, people hurrying in uh, configuration. Um, cabling errors. I'm not sure whether Peter's actually doing an EMC presentation. I just assumed you would be. No? No? Well, um, if you want to talk about EMC, Peter's your man. Um, and then device di diagnostics. Um, hopefully we're not going to see this for some time, uh, but ageing of devices, we're certainly seeing that in Profibus, is that just some devices, when they're 20, 25 years old, get a bit tired and like to have a sleep. Um, hopefully we're not going to see that for some time with Profinet devices. Um, Andy further wherever he's gone was at the back of the room and this is a blatantly stolen slide of his. Uh, this talks a little bit about Profibus problems uh, since we're doing Profibus and Profinet. Number one problem is wiring faults, reflections, wire breaks, short circuits, all that sort of stuff. Um, I was in a factory last week, um, lots of steam, lots of dust and I'm not sure if I've got a photo of the connector but the connector, when I took it apart, was absolutely full of muck. And it was absolutely no wonder that it didn't work. Um, if you scraped it with a screwdriver, then it did eventually show some signs of copper in there. But otherwise, it was pretty grim. Um, number two is interference from other things. One of the things that um, talking about is these. some of these modern inverters are using different frequencies. and then it's less effect, it was affecting the Profibus cabling more than the older ones. There are various other things that can f fall apart with it, but you know, they're relatively rare. So when we're talking about troubleshooting uh, Profibus or Profinet, it really doesn't matter. The most important thing that you can have is a plan. Who's going to deal with this problem? What training have they got? Have you got the tools to hand? Can you remember where, what the password is for the laptop? Um, can you remember where the software is? Um, went to a place not that long ago, and they knew that they had a laptop with the software installed on it. 
weren't quite sure where it was and their IT policy stopped you from installing any software on their laptops. So they must have spent half a day searching for the laptop to be able to use the tools. Um, nothing to do with how the network was performing, it was purely an admin problem. Second most important thing, in my opinion, a map. Um, how is your network actually configured? You may have a drawing from 10 years ago. Has somebody altered the network since? Has somebody added some devices, removed them, changed something? Uh, I've got an example of a, a great drawing and a bad drawing on the next slide. Um, and can you physically access the network? So, if it's a Profinet network, is there a spare port anywhere? If it's a Profi bus network, have you got piggyback connectors? If you've got no piggyback connectors, you've got to physically break the network to plug your test tool in before you can plug it back together again. So, having some piggyback connectors is really helpful. So, here is a wonderful example of a terrible drawing and a usable drawing. Um, there are devices out there that will do automatic drawings for you. Um, down on the left uh, is a drawing. On the right is a fairly clear drawing with the order that devices are in um, and uh, the distances between them. So, uh, time we got. We have a couple of minutes, so we'll talk very briefly about a couple of things that I have seen recently, and hopefully I've got the layering of these. I don't like doing animations on PowerPoint, but in this one particular instance, I think it, it'll work. So, I got called into a factory um, start of this year, and they had a problem with random odd dropouts. Didn't happen all the time. There didn't seem to be any sort of consistency as to when it was happening. Uh, but every few days, it was just dropping out. And I went in and had a look. And the signal quality was all right. The quality of the signal, it was working. Um, but mm, not great. So I had a look around, and what I found in one of the cupboards was a load of very short links. So each of these had you know, that much cable between them. Okay, but it's been working for 20 years. So, yeah, if it worked for the last 20 years, it will probably work for the next 20. Oh, well, change the cables. So we've got a meter, a meter and a half of cable between each of them. And the, cape, the signal quality picked up a little bit. Not brilliant, but it was better. Hmm. OK. Let's make it simpler. So disconnect half the devices. Test the network again. Ooh, that's a lot better. OK. Connect into the other half of the network. Hmm, that's not so good. OK. Do a little bit more testing. And oh, going round, the part of the problem was that um, every time we wanted to retest something, we were look working in an area like this. Sorry, the picture's not great. Um, every time you wanted to test something, first thing you had to do was put all the machinery back together and the guards back on every time you wanted to retest something. So this took two days to, to solve. Um, and the problem was really simple. So on the end of the rollers that are in there is a little device like this that uh, tells it where it is, how fast it's going, what's happening. Um, and we took it all apart, checked it, and the terminating resistor is switched on. We're like, well, that's good. Put it all back together, test it, still the same problem. Hmm, OK. All our tests are showing that there's not enough termination on this network. What's going on? And it turns out that the resistors actually in here had died. 
The switch was on, but nothing was happening. They went and pulled another one of these out of stores, put it in 10 minutes later, everything's working and absolutely fine. So the t the everything was set right, everything was working, but the resistor itself had died and that was the end of that. Okay, um, this is another one. This one was much more recent. Uh, this was last week. Uh, it was up, up in the grim north. Again, process stopping from time to time. Had a look at the signal quality and this is what I could see from my tool. We can see interesting things going on but half of the devices are not there. So have a please work. Have a look at the oscilloscope. Hmm, that's interesting. Any thoughts on that shape of that signal? Should be a nice rectangle. It's not. So have a look at a different one. Hmm. Okay. Move a little bit further down the line. Hmm. This isn't good either. Have a look at a different view. Uh, that's that's not right either. So start having a little poke around the network. Uh, and load of control cabinets. After a little bit of discussion with some of the engineers on site, we pull out one of these drawers and it's got these connectors on it and this is how each of the drawers interface with the rest of the world. And hopefully this is going to work. Essentially you've got a system like this where the cable comes snakes round and then off of those little buzz bars comes a little spur into each of the cabinets. So all of this here is basically capacitance as each of those spurs is getting filled up and taking time to empty. So, how do we? Oh, sorry, not quite enough. So, yeah, each of these each of these drawers has got one of these, and mm, about half a meter of cable going into it, causing a load of spurs. How do we get around it? Well, again, my job was to discover what the problem was, not to fix it. There's a couple of ways you can do with it. You can live with it, or you can fit something like this. There are many solutions. Um, from various different manufacturers, but essentially it's a hub. Um, it's not a cheap way to do it. Um, I don't think any of these, these devices are particularly cheap. However, they're a very, very good way of splitting a network up and resolve that problem where you've got multiple um, spurs, uh, which is not ideal. Okay, so couple of things just to finish off with. There are some paid for tools to help you with these things. There are some free tools. Some of the free tools, uh, Proneta, incredibly useful. Uh, it's uh, from Siemens. Uh, Wireshark, incredibly useful so long as you know how to use it. Um, and it is not the most user friendly tool, but it is free. So you pay your money and make your choices. Um, there's another variety of tools that I quite like, IP scanners. Again, there's a whole range of them, but very useful when you can't find a device. On the paid for, uh, paid for tools side, there are a number of companies uh, operating in the UK. Um, Softing, Presentec, Indosol, um, I don't know if Ideal Networks are still in the UK, but they're around somewhere um, with a variety of tools uh, for Profinet and Profibus. Um, when you get the um, slides, if you get emailed out the slides, there's a load of links. So the Profinet and Profibus design guides, installation guides and what have you, I've linked them all in there so they're nice and easy to find. 
Other than that, um, hopefully we're about in time for lunch. Any questions? Happy days. Okay, yeah, thanks very much, Dave. Um, yeah, just very briefly, as you mentioned, uh, EMC. Um, I'm not going to go into that subject in any great detail, but one thing's for certain, if you want a guarantee of uh, causing problems on a network, install a drive and don't, in don't read the installation guidelines. If you do that, it's a recipe for disaster. Uh, there's some very strange things that go on with drives, especially on the cable between the drive and the motor. They typically are generating about three megahertz of uh, emissions. And if that gets outside of the confines of that cable, it tends to couple with the bonding infrastructure. And then you have what's called uncontrolled common mode currents. And they themselves become emitters in their own right. Um, you might want to have a look at the 18th edition, the, the standard electrical installations. Doesn't say much about drives other than list them as an emitter. And then at the very end of that section on an EMC, there is a part that says, fundamentally, you can't claim conformance to this standard. This is assuming you're installing drives. You can't claim conformance to this standard unless you also claim conformance to the following. And one of them is 20 odd years old and tells you all about the things that you should do. And numerous times I've been on Profibus calls where we've clearly seen large pumps causing problems on Profibus. And all that I've done, this was a Siemens drive, and all that I did was printed out the installation guidelines for it and went round, and they hadn't done any of it. Well, clearly they've not got a leg to stand on there. There's some very strange things. And also Dave, uh, Dave alluded to the fact that um, things are getting worse, and that is true. There is, um, there is a, the actual transistors, these IGBTs in the output section of a drive, what they're made of limits the transition from off to on and on to off. If they could inc reduce that time to make it more of a square wave than it actually is, the drives would run cooler. So they're going to, the heat sinks would be smaller, they'd be in quotes green, which is all good, except that's going to give us even more emissions than they're giving now. So if you haven't got a problem now, don't get, be complacent and think you won't always have a problem. Uh, these, these, are, these are expensive to fix. And I think I was told EMC, a bit of an insurance policy, most of the time you get away with it, but if you don't, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. So anyway, um, basically, we're going to have a break now for lunch. Uh, uh, the food will be coming shortly. Um, we'll give you a shout back at the end. We've got a few more presentations from uh, Phil at Anderson Hauser. I'm also going to give a very short um, presentation concerning something new about the training. You'll notice there's lots of technologies that have been talked about here, some of which you might know, some of which uh, might be completely new to you. And I'm going to show you the training that you can get that is vendor independent, but includes all these technologies. But for now, thank you very much. Uh, it'll be obvious when the food is ready, um, and I'll give you a shout later on. Thank you.